today I am be, uh, going to speak about a bit about things that are coming in Rails 5, Action Cable, Rails API, and how you can use them in a front-end technology like say React and build your own modern single page uh, web apps. Uh, I have a super interesting slot being given to me that is just after lunch, so if you're feeling sleepy, don't worry. Given I'm jet lagged, you can go ahead and sleep. Uh, um, my name is Vipul. Uh, I go by Vipul and Sword uh, on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, and I'm part of the Rails Issues team and I, hel I help Rails uh, triage Rails issues and contribute. And this is me on uh, the Rails contributors list. Uh, when I'm not doing uh, contributions, I spend most of our time uh, at my company, which is called as Big Binary, uh, which we spoke a bit about uh, previously in the session of hiring. Uh, it's a remote team, uh, like completely remote team, wherein uh, people work from different countries, and most of them like are from India, and it's based out of Miami. It's a Ruby on Rails consulting, and we do things like React JS, React Native, etc. That's where my experience comes in from, like React. Uh, this is my second time in Taiwan. Uh, I was here last year. I spoke more about React uh, in a RubyConf. Uh, and uh, like last time I went, when I was here, it was like pretty pleasant. That's what I got from the weather. And then when I was landing, like just landing, Rexy, uh, Rexy sent everyone of the speakers a message that the weather is in Taiwan is hot with chances of rain in the afternoon. I'm like, what? I'm already coming in from a uh, you know, summer hot city wherein uh, I can't wear this. Uh, and I'm like, why again I'm going to face that? And then I went and quickly checked up what the weather is because I, I, I'm in love in weather. When I go to the States, that's the first thing that I do because they have like 48 different weather channels just to, just to keep you focused on weather. So I see this and I'm like, this is like 30 degrees? Why is he saying hot? This is <laughs> because where I live, this is from Pune, where I travel, this is my weather, and it's like six, seven degrees more. And this was even more surprising because the city in where my brother lives is currently currently around 42. So it's like, yay, I'm going in a Awesome, I'm going on a winter vacation. All right, so that's why I can wear this because yesterday I was feeling pretty cold. Um, all right, so moving on. Uh, today I'm going to speak more about uh, this kind of architecture uh, and what are the different components involved in this architecture uh, uh, and take a look at bits and pieces of these uh, and how you can transition towards this kind of architecture wherein you have isolated components interacting with each other. Uh, traditionally, if you build a Rails app, like previously, uh, uh, we have we have started having uh, services, microservices as well. But previously, it used to be like you have a single monolith Rails app, wherein all of your representation logic or your uh, or your backend logic, your views, etc., all were being served from one single Rails application. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we started having different architectures like. Uh, we move from monoliths to microservices, etc. Today, I'm not going to speak about those kind of architectures, but focus on how you can distribute, uh, like how you can divide your main Rails application in terms of uh, your front-end services or display and how they can start consuming your resources from your Rails API. So traditionally, what you had is this monolith, but s slowly, uh, as we uh, like towards the end of uh, the last decade, we started having a lot of services which came like tried to understand and came to know that instead of serving this whole big view of HTML, why not just send small bits and pieces of say uh, JSON uh, over over the wire and using that JSON update my front end. So what started happening is many services started sending out or start giving out your uh, updates in terms of JSON or some similar services. So today I'll be speaking briefly uh, and this is like the five minute version in case you go to sleep in the middle of the talk. Uh, please pay attention for five minutes. So we'll be speaking about uh, Rails API. We'll be going very deep into it, uh, like what Rails API is and how you can build Rails, uh, like API-only apps. 
uh, we'll be speaking about peripheral services. Uh, there are many, many various different ones, like you can have uh, export uh, your services using JSON. You have API where you take the, the communication takes place. We'll be going in depth with Action Cable, which is one of the fun things that I find with Rails uh, 5, uh, and other services like you can have authentication and multiple different services. So we'll be going deep again on Rails API, only applications, Action Cable, and uh, how they interact with each other. So you have your basic uh, API app, which is slimmed down version. It is not going to do any kind of display uh, activities. It's only going to keep uh, to manipulation of your data and act as a data store and just emit this information, which is then going to be consumed with services like uh, you can have JSON, consumer services. Uh, you can have n number of backend, like front end services over here, which will consume a single point of source that can be React, that can be Ember, that can be Angular, Meteor, or any kind of front end technology. Uh, up, along with that, it can be services like you have your mobile based services, which will again use a single point of uh, service, uh, like your API service to consume all your resources and update those views. Uh, Partly the, uh, why I want to speak uh, about this is as and when this transition has started happening uh, and front end, uh, like various different front end uh, frameworks have started gaining popularity. In today's day, uh, like age, it makes sense that uh, we have this kind of uh, support for these kind of technologies where you do not need a lot of interaction, but just need bits and pieces of data from the server. So Rails 5 progresses towards this, uh, like tries to progress and support this kind of uh, services uh, in terms of having API-only applications. So two things that, uh, again, uh, are uh, great introductions to Rails 5 are the API apps and Action, action Cable. Uh, I'll not be going through all of different things that happen in Rails 5. Uh, again, uh, just a link over here. You can go over and see blog.bigpanel.com. We have a blog series only for uh, all of the different changes which are coming to Rails 5. Uh, you can get a better idea from there. There are around 40 plus, and we keep on blogging about those. Uh, so begin to begin with, we'll see the first part, which is API-only applications. So what I mean by uh, an API application, uh, when you think of an API application, uh, previously, again, we used to have this main application, and slowly, uh, we, used to, we used to just have this web app, wherein you were serving all your requests over uh, your browser. Slowly and steadily, uh, people started wanting to have support from your app and provide that support to your mobile apps. So what you ended up, or, or some different service, and what you ended up having is this service which is talking to your main data source in your Rails application, and which is going to export some kind of API, uh, which as a, again is still living in your main Rails application. Slowly, as it progressed, we started seeing that there was a lot of consumption of resources from these API apps. So instead of that, we ended up having services uh, like, say, uh, these are some examples like developer.github.com, twitter.com. Uh, these are some of the API applications where the main objective was just serving API and serving data from that particular API. This is one of an example of how this might look. Uh, many of you must have used or created an API. Everyone knows JSON, right? Awesome. Uh, so this is an example of uh, how emojis are represented by API in on GitHub. Uh, good thing, like, uh, curious thing to note about over here is uh, some of these services started consuming their own resources to have their service display the data uh, on their web app as well. So, or con consider these services as external and then have these services been consumed. For an example, like Twitter or Dev Twitter, they consume their own services as well to show information in their apps. So, this slow progression leads us to this architecture that we were speaking about, that having your own service of API and consuming that service itself to display however you want to manipulate your uh, views in uh, other different services, like your web app, your mobile app, or any different service. Uh, when you think about this and you end up like, okay, I need to build an API now because I'm starting with a new project and I want to build an API so that I can have uh, mobile, mobile first, approach and build my API for mobile consumption or web consumption. So one thing that comes to my uh, comes to our mind is like, why why exactly should I use Rails? Like I can, instead of doing that, I can use maybe a Java service or I can end up using, if I'm familiar with Sinatra, I would go with Sinatra because it's like, it doesn't have so much different things that Rails has, like it's, Rails is huge. So why should I actually use Rails? 
uh, to think of in that terms, uh, when you think about it, uh, if you already know Rails, you're pretty much familiar with the Rails development environment. You're pretty comfortable with, I, uh, with the different things that Rails provides you with. Uh, it has, uh, and this is one of the main like important things that it follows is convention over configuration, which is one of my favorite things that it does is any developer who comes, he knows what environment he's going to face. Uh, it has powerful testing, inbuilt security, uh, like uh, it has uh, like providing uh, message verifiers, cookie verifiers, signatures, etc. Uh, it provides you inbuilt support for parameter passing. You don't need to think about what has been coming into the request. It provides you easy code reloading uh, and other things again from the development environment. It provides you with uh, nifty header responses uh, so that you don't need to do like, you know, craft your own custom header responses to be provided by your API. Uh, and along with this, you have, again, bundled together a lot of beauty of active record, action mailer, if you're using mailing services, you have action, um, act, like active job, uh, and then recently added action cable. Uh, my important thing, like my favorite amongst these is, uh, as and when we are progressing amongst these uh, like services, front-end services, we have, like, we come to see that there are a lot of services which we do not need to have Rails, and we can just store them, go ahead and store them in something like Firebase or MongoDB and just consume from them. My favorite uh, reason for using these is Active Record. How many of you hate or love Active Record? See, I said hate and love, so everyone can raise. So that gives you, like, Active Record is pretty powerful, uh, and if you love it, uh, it gives you, like, pretty could handle over manipulating your data and exposing that data. Uh, along with uh, this, uh, or like the main source of interaction for your service is going to be action pack, uh, which is your controllers and all the different things that happen in your controller. So action pack is going to provide you with very good uh, like inbuilt things like your resource, route full resourcing. It is going to provide you with URL helpers like uh, blog underscore edit, edit blog path or uh, things like that. Uh, it is going to provide you with inbuilt caching support, uh, authentication, redirect, again, creating of headers, uh, manipulate, like respond to, uh, accepting and responding to multiple different content types. Uh, instead of crafting your own different codes, it provides you with easy generators. And again, it has very powerful support for plugins so that you can easily embed a lot of plugins, third party plugins, which you, which you can use in your application. For example, like rat cause, which we'll see uh, towards the end. Uh, which is again for having co uh, cross origin requests. Uh, the simplest way to start creating, uh, Chatty is the name of application we'll see towards the end, is just say Rails new, and this is on uh, the RC version right now. If you're using that, just say Rails new, uh, the application name, and just pass hyphen hyphen API. Uh, the important part is you are just, when you're creating a new Rails application, you are just saying hyphen hyphen API. And that's it. You're done. You are. You have created your API app. You can start using it. Uh, so what basically this does is, instead of having this whole bunch of things which are provided with your basic uh, Rails API, uh, Rails app, it slims down a lot of things. It slims down a lot of middlewares uh, that are in your basic Rails app, and instead of it removes them and builds you, gives you a slimmed down version of that. It removes importantly it does not have any views. It removes a lot of cruft from your action view because now you're not going to use your basic temp uh, like templates or uh, your views. You're going to uh, rely a lot on JSON templates, like JSON-based resources. Uh, it also provides you with action controller API, which is different from your action controller base. Again, it is slimmed down version of your bigger controller. Uh, how many of you have heard of action controller metal or used it? AC metal? Yes, so before API, uh, when I wanted like when I wanted to use or provide a small slim down version, we would use action controller metal. And inside of that metal, you would include whatever different number of modules you would like to use uh, in your uh, like uh, in your controller to expose a sim slim down version of your controller. So API comes like action controller API comes with same defaults for providing you with getting started with an API uh, API controller again, which is slim down. This, this is a sl default stack. Uh, I don't want to go deep in that, but it, it has basic support for, say, send file, uh, sending of files, static file, uh, like 
supporting static file uh, uh, request IDs, login like log logging support, callbacks, etc. Uh, all of these are like middlewares, which are like the default stack for API app. You can again, based on your needs, you can add more uh, middlewares, or you can remove them, make down make your app even slimmer if you don't use something like you don't use a send file from your API app. Go ahead and remove it. Uh, and the aim being that you want to keep your app simple enough and make it even more faster. Uh, on the action controller side, again, your controller is slimmed down and it has basic support for, say, URL4, it has support for redirecting, it has support for rendering, and a bunch of different things uh, which are listed over here. Uh, like parameters passing, params wrapper, instrumentation, force SSL, etc. And on top of this, you can, like, go on and add multiple different other uh, modules, include those modules for having, let's say, like translation. You would like to use translation, go ahead and include that. Uh, or you would like cookies, you would include that and extend your particular controller. Uh, I am not going too deep into how your API app should be, because that will be a completely different talk. My main point of like trying to focus was how Rails is moving towards a way that you will have slimmed down versions of your app so that you could support these kinds of and actually develop and have an environment where you're only focused on building your API services. You can again extend and reduce uh, however your app uh, needs to be. My next uh, uh, focus point of focus is going to be Action Cable and how uh, that is relevant and uh, why I like it. Um, so this is something which has been like pretty uh, exciting thing. It, uh, it was introduced at uh, the last RailsCon. Uh, and uh, it allows you to have WebSocket based, like real-time communication based uh, updates in your Rails app. Uh, what is Action Cable? So how many of you used any of these services or have used something like WebSocket? Everyone else writes HTML. Ah, I'm just kidding. Uh, so if you or have heard of these services. So these services allow you to have something as called as PubSub or Publisher Subscription Based Model wherein previously what you used to do is, hey, I, I have pressed this button. I want to have more information about this page. Go ahead and make a request with, to that web server and render the whole page. That was be pretty huge. Then we moved on to the thing like, oh, I don't need to do that. I have jQuery. Why not just get this part of page get that as HTML and just go and append that to my particular page. So I would say, hey, I press this button, go get that part and update over here. Or you would have a page wherein you would have some interactions like a dashboard and based on that, you would like to, you know, update some information getting it from the backend server. Many of you, like even I, w what we would like to do is have polling. That is every one minute, go and try to fetch some data from the server. Has something changed? Yes, something has changed, go and update my page. This is expensive on your server as well as on your client because you're unnecessarily going and pinging your server, hey, give me some data. Instead of this, the alternative, alternative model is you have a subscription to your uh, server saying, hey, uh, I'm, opening a, uh, I'm opening a connection. If there is, any, is, is, an, is there any change on the server, let me know about that change. Instead of I asking you, you let me know about it. So that's what how PubSub works, uh, you create uh, you have a publisher, you have a subscriber, your client is going to subscribe to some updates. Uh, think of uh, these in terms of Redis. Everyone has used Redis or have heard of it. So Redis has, in the same terms, uh, pops up, uh, which is, I don't know if it's quite uh, used or not, but I use it a lot, uh, for having, like, same, pops up uh, ideology, wherein you have a channel, and on that channel, you're going to publish or subscribe to some updates. Uh, Similarly, we'll map those concepts to Action Cable, wherein you have dedicated server-side components, which represent your Redis side of components, wherein you have your connections, that is how you connect to your Redis, uh, and then you have subscriptions, that is on this, I didn't do that. Uh, and then, uh, then you have subscriptions, that is on this connection, uh, we are going to subscribe to certain part of updates. You don't want all the updates, you only want updates related to say, a message. And on the client side, you will have similar components, which in Action Cable you can implement using JavaScript or CoffeeScript, 
your choice. Uh, and the main important concept being here of consumers. Your main uh, important function of your client is going to be that of consumers. And whatever, whenever there's an update, you receive that data and update your uh, pages. Uh, we saw this. Yep. So on the server side, so we'll look into deep in, on both of these sides. On the server side, we have four important things, or three important things over here, which is connections, channels, and subscriptions. Map these, again, to your Redis terminology, wherein you have a connection to Redis. You have a channel, where you're listening to a channel on Redis. And then you have subscriptions, which is actually going and receiving and uh, sending of data on that particular channel. So let's take a look at how connection will be represented in your action cable. So connection, you can think of in terms of when there is a client, uh, we have a server running to receive more connections. When a client comes and loads and says, hey, I want to create a WebSocket from this page to the server, it will go and create a connection with your server. That connection is going to be represented by this object behind the scenes uh, on your server by a connection object. Here is the place where you're going to use to specify connection-specific information, like how you identify this connection. What? So let's say a user is connecting by his user ID. You will use that for identifying this connection, uh, which you, you can use later on. Uh, or you can provide things like authentication. Do I allow this connection to this particular user or not? Uh, and this is the basic uh, fundamental thing that is going to be used throughout your uh, backend. Then we have things like channels. Uh, again, these are like a channel similar to how you have in Redis, wherein uh, you'll have Basically, you'll have the main channel over here, which is application cable channel, similar to how you have application controller. Here, you can define your uh, application-wide information regarding, like, have all those things that you need to do all across the applications at one place. And then, based on multiple different things, like you may have an update channel, you may have a user channel, or a message channel, you can have different channels. Uh, after you have these channels, you are ultimately going to end up using these channels by way of subscriptions. And these are, th these are the things that actually go on inside your uh, channels. Like you see over here, we have subscribe method. So this is the main entry point when the client is trying to connect with your uh, server. Whenever there is a connection being created, the method subscribed is going to be called when you can perform some setup uh, method like uh, say, identify this connection and store that this client has been connected to me or not. And then you can have your custom actions over here, which uh, can be anything like post broadcasting some data back to your client. On your client side, we have two, two different notions. One is of consumer connection and a subscription that is used for connecting to that particular uh, connection. So connection, like your main connection on your, of your app is again going to be a global connection. It is going to be an object. Uh, this is, again, picked out of how it is provided as is. Um, we'll create a main connection by means of application cable dot create consumer. If you notice over here, what we have is uh, this create consumer method over here, uh, which is provided by action cable. What this says is, uh, and we are not passing any parameters over here. So what this says is, when this is used from inside your Rails application, create a connection and try to create a connection to the default URL, to the default server where I am being loaded. So the URL over here for, like in terms of WebSocket, you need to provide to which server I need to connect to. So this is kind of picked up automatically from your uh, application template. Uh, this is important to note because in cases of your apps, your apps may live on multiple different apps. Here is the place where you're going to say, hey, my Rails app is running on Ruby on Rails.org. Pass in the URL over here. WS, whatever the protocol is, and ask it to connect to that particular server. Uh, after you have created this connection, ultimately you're going to use this connection to create what are called the subscriptions to channels. We have discussed about connections on server, subscriptions on server. These are going to be represented on your client in terms of subscription. What I'm seeing over here is on load of my page, create a subscription to this particular chat channel. So I've loaded the chat page. And what I'm saying is, go ahead and create a connection. I want to receive updates from chat channel. And then I can pass custom parameters identifying what chat channel do I want to connect to. I have a chat-based service. I'm saying, hey, I want to go. I, I have gone to the best room or uh, real specific room. 
I want to listen to all the updates which are being sent there, and that's how you can identify it by parameters. Oh. We have these two things. We have a server. We have our uh, client-based things represented by connections, subscriptions, subscribers. We are going to tie these together by means of two things. One is streams, and the other one is broadcastings. Uh, both of them have their own different uses. Uh, is this visible behind? Yep. Ah, okay. So streams are what we are going to see as an example later as well. Uh, are the basic. Uh, we have multiple different methods for streams, like we see over here. Streams are the basic way of saying, hey, when some uh, update is being done, stream this data, whatever broadcast is done on this channel, stream it straight to through the web socket and send it towards the client. That's all the stream methods do. Uh, here it says stop all stream, stop all connections which are active. Uh, stream from, stream from a channel, this channel, and a connection identified by chat room. Remember that previously what we were doing is we were passing the room over here. The same room is made available in your params hash, and that params hash I'm going to use to identify the connection I'm going to create over this particular channel. Similarly, we can also use another method, which is stream for. It is a convenient way of you know, using your active record objects directly. It will automatically create the ID for you and start streaming based on this particular uh, active record object. After you have the streamings, other way of communicating is that of, like, you have these stream set up. You want to actually send the data over it. What you're going to do is call the broadcast to. Everyone is awake. This is the main thing that you need to know. Broadcast is a way that you're actually going to send information from your server to your client. What we are doing over here is we are identifying. So in previous case, what will happen over here is I will say chat channel dot broadcast to the message room, the name ID, that ID, identify that ID, and send the payload. This is going to be the payload, right? Similarly, you can broadcast directly to some active record object and say, hey, I have some new comments on this post. Go ahead and update all the posts, uh, all the comments for this particular post. Make sense? Yes, no, I don't care. <laughs> all right. Uh, on the client side, when the broadcast happens, similar to how you have web sockets. Uh, again, how many of you use web sockets? Oh, quite a few. On WebSockets, you have a structure like WebSocket connection dot on, and then you provide a block on the client side, which says, hey, on receive of some data, do this. On connecting to a client, do this. On connecting to a service, do this. Similarly, we can map those concepts on our client side in action table, like we have provided over here, on received. We, we also have on connect. So on receiving, uh, whenever a broadcast is done, the method received will be called with the data that is provided. So in previously, we had this payload. This payload of title and body will be received over here in this data. <coughs> After receiving this data, then we can take this data and then go ahead and send it to a, some custom method wherein we use that data to update some part of this page. Here I'm just doing like append HTML. Uh, this is not going to be a final objective, but here we are just using this data to create some HTML out of it, and then we are appending it to the uh, page that, oh, some update has occurred. I received something from the server. Go ahead and update my page. Uh, this uh, like WebSocket communication is two-way. So from your WebSocket itself, you can send something back to your server. And Action Cable makes it super easy to call your server, like your methods on your server as well. So here is how what you would do is say this dot perform, and this is something like from within your subscription, you would say perform and some method name. By calling this, what will happen is it will perform or call some custom method that you have defined in your channel. So what will happen is it will call the follow method in your message channel and deliver this payload, message ID. You can also send some uh, arbitrary data to chat channel wherein it will call the receive method on the server itself. But this is this is important to f follow here is that you can call custom methods and this is ultimately what you will end up doing is 
call some method uh, which is going to be performing different app, uh, different actions based on what kind of interaction you want to do from a web socket. Uh, so we have all of this set up, we have a server, we have a client, then uh, to start actually to actually start using this in your services, there are some things that you need to take care of. Uh, we need to allow requests to be from different origins. So WebSocket needs to be from like Rails by default says that the request should, should be from the same origin. Why this is so that some request, some random request some, from some different domain should not should not be allowed to execute some task on your particular application. So that's how, that's why we already have this setup in Rails. You should allow, you should add your domains from where you're going to run your action cable service so that your action cable service can actually communicate. <coughs> and then you'll have disabled request forgery. How many of you know what is request forgery? Or X CSRF? Yeah, CSRF everyone knows. So, to allow this, like CSRF is basically to disable, like uh, not allow cross-site scripting. So to allow our service to actually do that, by default Rails has CSRF. To allow the like WebSocket to communicate, we would need to disable a part of it, and that is what we are doing over here. All right, we have done all this, and how we are actually going to run our action cable servers. So one important change which Rails 5 brings is. It started using Puma as the default server. It used to use Webrick before, uh, and one of the important decisions to add Puma was that uh, Action Cable needs to have concurrent connections, and this is this is what, what like Action Cable give, like gets a lot of pow power from having Puma as the default server, so that Puma like Puma is a concurrent server, so it allows to have concurrent connections or ongoing from your one particular server. There are multiple different ways of deploying your action cable server. It can be embedded within your Rails application, or it can be like, you have your Rails application, then you have independent action cable server, which is just going to, uh, you know, get connections and interact with those, with those connections. We'll take a look at that kind of way of handling your action cable uh, connections. Uh, finally, we have the third, uh, the third piece of our architecture, which is the front end. Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, React.js over here. It doesn't need to be that. It can be your own, like, favorite framework. I don't mind whichever framework you like. It can be Angular. Um, uh, it can be Ember. Uh, I'm just going to say a bit about React.js. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, pretty deep. Just a few points about React.js. How many of you have heard of React.js? Have, how many of you have used React.js? So, just to give you a brief about it, uh, this this example is straight straight away taken from the Getting Started Guide on Facebook. Uh, what React tries to do is it tries to define your app in what are called as components. So here, what I'm doing is I'm defining a hello message component by using React.create class, and I only need to have one important mandatory method, which is render. This render needs to supply or return back what HTML I need to display on my page. Uh, important thing to note over here is I am using HTML from within my uh, JavaScript, and what is what is being used over here is called as JSX, which is uh, JavaScript XML notif. What's that? Yeah, that. Uh, so it allows you to have this kind of syntax from within your HTML, and uh, it uh, it allows you to embed your custom uh, your JavaScript data inside of your HTML. Uh, what I'm doing over here is the data that I'm passing over here when I'm rendering, by render I mean actually display the component at some mount node, I will be passing some information over here. So this is my component, I'm saying render this component on my page and when it is rendering, use this information. Again, just basic HTML over here. Here is a bit uh, bigger component what it is doing is, it is a simple timer. It is just, uh, what it is doing is, it is having initial state. Initial state is kind of like your constructor where you're defining the initial mutable state of your component, something that you're going to change. A tick is a method. So we have a timer over here, timer object, which is every one second it is going to update the data. Uh, seconds elapsed, 
uh, I have component uh, did mount, which is a lifecycle method. Uh, what it does is when a component is rendered, it is going to say every one second, set an interval that the tick method is going to be called over here, which is going to increase the seconds. And we have component will unmount, that is on unmounting, go ahead and uh, remove the interval that was created. And finally, we have the render method over here. Now, why is this important or pertinent to our, like, uh, relative to our example is that here, I'm not doing anything like dot .html dot .append or dot .html, like, you know, dollar dot do something manipulation on my page. All I'm doing is I'm just changing the seconds elapsed in, in my particular state. Set state is actually to, you know, change the state of this method, uh, like, component. Why this is important? It fits perfectly in terms of your action cable or service like that, wherein you're not going to perform any changes when some new data has been provided to you by the server. All you're going to do is some updates have been done, action cable will send it, update it over here, the data will be received over here, it will just update the data, React will take care of, or the service will take care of updating your view based on whatever the information is. This helps you reduce a lot of complex and like custom logic for updating your views. A bit about lifecycle because we are going to use it. React has, React has this lifecycle uh, of component creation, component mounting. So these are some of its methods like will mount, did mount, initial state for initial, um, uh, like mutable state, uh, props, which are like properties which are passed as parameters to the component, which are non-mutable, uh, render what is actually being rendered, and other methods like which we are not interested like now, like component will unmount, and some other custom methods. Uh, I'm not going deep into that. You can read this book that I finished after a year. I don't know how that got, got over. So you can read this book, React.js by example, which goes through a lot of uh, actual app examples. In, instead of going through chapters, it goes through apps. It tries to see how you can build apps. Uh, and with that, I'm done with the main three parts. Uh, again, sorry, that was for later, don't see that. Uh, I'll be going through these two examples now as demos. Uh, before that, is everyone awake? Hey. Can you clap? Oh no, I'm not done. So, uh, I'm going to do two demos basically. Uh, and what those demos are going to be is that uh, one is the main application examples, I have not done like build custom example. I'm just take, picking up the example uh, which is available, made available by Action Cable. Uh, and I've just modified it to be a reactive version, like React.js version of it. So here I have the main, uh, uh, this is not visible, that's, but that's okay. Here I am running, yes. This is the Rails application. Uh, I'm running the Rails application which has Action Cable uh, tied up with it. And this is a very basic application, if you can see over here. Yes, it's running on localhost 3000. Is this visible? Yes, no. So it is very pretty primitive. What it does is it's like it has four users, hard-coded users. You can just log into one of those users. Uh, so I'm going to say I want to log in with notorious big, and then I want to listen to messages like live comments on some messages, and we have some message like the schnitz over here, and it is a message over here, and it is just uh, basic architecture, posts and messages, uh, like message and com com comments on that message. Uh, we have message over here, and uh, like whenever I comment over here, it should it goes back to the server and is going to update. Uh, this is on the, like this is on, this is not an incognito, this is in incognito. Uh, what I'm doing over here is I'm running as a different, uh, like different person over here and I'm going to go on the same uh, message. Uh, and what I expect is when some person from here, uh, and hopefully that works, whenever I type something from here, it should send it here. Oh, it worked. Yay. 
Yes. Work. So this is right now it is on the same application. It is running from Rails. It is all doing the things inside of Rails. And I have five minutes left. Awesome. Uh, so all of this is done from one single application. Uh, this is all okay, but my main like uh, focus of this presentation was you can have this Rails application, but you can have other applications like I'm running a node application over here just to make sure that I'm doing that and I'm not lying. Uh, here is a node app. Yes, I know how to do node. Uh, I'm seeing npm start. It is starting on localhost 9000. Yes. And here we are on localhost 9000. So this is being served from my node application, which is a very basic React.js application. And again, it, what I've done is it, uh, it is hard coded to listen on messages that message ID with message ID one. So you see this message over here is again being saved over here. So we did not have this, but a week ago or a week or two ago, we uh, package like a NPH package was added uh, and will be supported uh, officially by Rails uh, for Action Cable. And then you can start having using this Action Cable uh, package from your uh, node applications as well. So uh, let's see if this works. This is my Node.js application. Uh, this is my Rails application. They are running on different servers. This works as well. Yes. Yes, it works. I have to scroll, though. You see this? I hope so. Oh, let's let's do this. Yay. Awesome. Yay. Nothing is happening there. Yay. So this is awesome because now we can have a real server act as a point where it is not doing anything but just communicating over a WebSocket and API to update these different apps like mobile app, your uh, Node app, your Ember app, and communicate over this particular WebSocket, uh, which is like sending tiny bits of data and updates, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I'll just go briefly over the example. Oh yeah, and it works. Uh, so this is like uh, how this is basically set up. We, we saw how the subscriptions are made. We have the subscription which is creating, su subscribing to the comments channel. In our React component, what I'm saying is when the component is mounted, call this setup subscription. And in the setup subscription, I'm going to create the subscription, pass in the message ID to which I want to listen, and then say follow a method which is on the server. And on receiving of this data received, all I'm doing is just updating the state and the React component will take care of, uh, like take care of updating my web page. On my server side, I have to do nothing else but just set up this state where it's follow, where it is receiving data and saying, oh, you want to listen to this message ID? Go ahead, listen to this message ID. And, uh, then to actually deliver it, you will call the broadcast, broadcast to this message ID, send all the data when, whenever a new comment has been created. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the takeaway that I would like to have is, you have these uh, monolithic apps. Now, when you, when you come across that you have a requirement wherein you want to build uh, an isolated, mo like in, in our case, we have some examples where a client already has a front-end app and they want to extend it or build something uh, on top of it. A very good way of doing that is having Rails API or slim down version of this API and provide all these services, which then can be consumed again by these multiple different services like JS, like React, Ember, etc., mobile, which makes pretty much sense to have this kind of architecture for just manipulating your data source. With that, I'm done. Thanks. We have 30 seconds. Quick 30 seconds question. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, is there, uh, I saw the relation cable repository and uh, the subscription uh, adapter now only supports Redis and the PG. So is there any way, uh, is it easy to, I want to use like RabbitMQ or Firebase? 
Uh, yes. So his question was about having different adapters. I was speaking all in terms of Redis. Uh, so the communication or receiving of data behind the scenes happens in terms of an adapter. You can have, uh, by default, we support uh, Redis, we support Postgres. What else? I need to check, but uh, you can define your own adapter to use that kind of PubSub service uh, behind the scenes for managing all the PubSub that is happening on Action Cable. So yeah, you can do that. Yes? Does it work with React Native? I need to experiment with that, but I would love to love to have that work. Uh, the only thing that I would need to see is uh, the WebSocket support on React Native. Uh, it would basically work in web views, but on like actual socket support for like native socket support, I need to check. But it, it will work on the uh, web sockets, like uh, web views. That, that'd be awesome. Thanks. Sorry? Yeah, that would be awesome. I hope it yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to do that, but like, I was sleeping. <laughs> so, awesome. Thanks.